are going to be in from 27 of August to 1st of September next year, 2023 in Washington DC. This is going to be awesome. And this week we have more two activities. We are going to have Dr. Mary Cohen talking about uh, the fate of neonatal, uh, of the neo aorta in congenital heart disease. It's going to be a very nice echo series. Uh, we are happy to have her back with her series. And on the same day, we are going to have uh, and Dr. Anderson finalizing uh, sequential segmental analysis of, uh, of the heart is going to be awesome. And then you have one more about the conduction uh, system is going to be uh, very nice. And today we are happy to have Dr. Silverman talking to us about hypoplastic uh, left heart syndrome on the echomorphological comparisons. It's going to be an amazing session. I hope all of you enjoy and please type uh, your questions on the Q&A chat box. So Dr. Silverman is going to be happy to answer in the end of this meeting. Thank you very much, Dr. Silverman. And thank you very much for all of you to attend. Well, thank you very much, Grace. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Can you see it? Not yet. Oh dear. Let's try this now. Please try again later. I'll just let me try that one more time. Yes, please. Okay. Um, so here, share screen. Yes. And then here. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Just go to presentation mode. Yes. All right. Great. Amazing. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for attending this session at the Congenital Heart Academy. We're going to discuss in the next few sessions the functionally single ventricle. And today we're going to talk about hyperplastic left ventricles. Okay. Uh, and um, of course, you see the um, site for the congenital heart academy at the bottom of the screen. And all this uh, presentation is also available uh, uh, on the md1world.com uh, for with uh, uh, um, uh, some uh, legends to describe uh, what we are seeing today so that and in, in greater detail. So if you want to see uh, that, you can look at it at these, one of these two sites uh, to uh, repeat the lecture again. Now, what is a functionally single ventricle? Well, it describes a spectrum of congenital heart malformations in which the ventricular mass may not readily lend itself to partitioning that commits one ventricular pump to the systemic circulation and another to the pulmonary circulation. So that takes care of all functionally single ventricles, and that's the national definition. Now, when we talk about hyperplastic left heart syndrome, we are also talking about um, a phenotypic feature of the syndrome that is the presence of concordant atrioventricular and ventricular arterial connections along with an intact ventricular septum. And that is finite in terms of making the definition of this condition. So in this section of the functionally single ventricles, we will discuss the absent left atrioventricular connection with mitral and aortic atresia, mitral stenosis and aortic atresia, mitral stenosis with aortic atresia. We will then look at the pulmonary venous obstruction from the intact ventricular septum and the atrial septum, the alternate sources of pulmonary venous drainage, coarctation, and if we have time, post-operative assessments uh, specific to these syndromes. Now, when we look at the spectrum of diseases that you see, there are a number of diseases that occur in this condition. And not all of them uh, are related to the fact that there was a critical aortic stenosis in utero. And in this example here on the left-hand side, you can see a almost slit-like left ventricle with no connection between the left atrium and the left ventricle. The right atrial right ventricular connection is, is present. So this is the mitral atresia, aortic atresia situation. And of course, one has to hunt for this little slit-like chamber, which is often uh, impossible to define morphologically. So not all of the hyperplasts that we see are related 
to um, the uh, presence of critical aortic uh, stenosis with a failed left ventricle. The other examples here are examples of these type of issues. Here is a left ventricle where there is uh, a lot of obstruction and hypertrophy that has occurred. And the hypertrophy has obstructed the left ventricular outflow tract so that there's now aortic atresia. There is a papillary muscle underneath this, which you'll the label, which you'll see in a moment. And of course, when you have something like this, the perfusion of the heart is varied. Perfusion goes from the outside in, from the coronary arteries, and work goes from the inside out. And we'll show this a little later on. So that there's the development of ischemia. And ischemia can lead to the presence of acidosis. And then, of course, metastatic calcification within the left ventricle that you see in the next example. With a small ascending aorta and also a coarctation present here. Here's an example of a patient in whom the ischemia led to the presence of endocardial fibrolastosis, <clears throat> a thin layer or thickened layer, in fact, of fibro, uh, fibrous tissue lying within the left ventricle, which restricts both the filling and the emptying. You can see the papillary muscles and the tendinous cords are also covered with this, in this case where there is a patent mitral valve. And the last and rarest example is this example of a dead left ventricle with multiple infarcts within the ventricular cavity. Now we're going to uh, look at what happens on the aorta. And again, this is a dynamic condition. And so there, is, um, there are issues that occur in the, um, the, um, the aorta. If it develops early in life, there is no left ventricle, and the ascending aorta is merely a conduit with the, for retrograde flow to the coronary arteries. As you see here, small structure, about one-tenth of the size of the diameter of the pulmonary trunk. Then there's a patient in whom there was prograde flow and retrograde flow, and to, the, to a greater or lesser degree, when this aortic stenosis occurs, uh, uh, um, uh, finalizes its uh, pathology, may lead to the presence of greater or lesser degrees of flow in the ascending aorta. So in this example here that you see, there's a bifid apex here with a sort of much larger left ventricle than the absence of the ventricular chamber that you see here. So the point about this condition is that it's a variable condition, and it's dynamic in the sense that when it occurs in utero, the events that occur change the final presentation that we see in the neonate with this condition. Now, for the rest of this presentation, we're going to follow a standard format. The first thing that I will let you notice is the scan or fan that shows the position of the echocardiogram then that, once that's been established, that will be stopped and the labels will explain what we're looking at. So here's the superior cava, here's the ascending aorta, the brachycephalic artery, the transverse aorta, and the pulmonary trunk. You don't see a left ventricle over here because it's hyperplastic. And we can't see the end part of the ventricle here because the right ventricle is lying over this. I've rotated the heart from its conventional position, so it conforms to the ventricular uh, echo that we see here, the echocardiogram. And here you can see the ascending aorta. You see the coronary arteries. You see the sinuses of Alsalva, which are usually present. And you can see the transverse aorta. We see right pulmonary artery, the left atrium, and the right ventricle underneath it over here, right atrium right ventricle. And here you can see that there's retrograde flow, red flow in systole perfusing the coronary arteries, but no flow out of the coronary system <coughs> from the aorta. <clears throat> and then lastly, we will zoom this up so that those of you that are looking at this 
on a smartphone will be able to get a larger magnification of the study. And this will be the format that we'll adopt throughout the rest of this presentation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here is another example of a parasternal long axis. <clears throat> And here, excuse me one moment, please. I apologize for this. Here we see endocardial fibroelastosis in a left ventricle of moderate size. There is the aortic valve. <clears throat> here is the pulmonary valve. And you can see the difference between the aortic and the pulmonary valve. There's also mitral stenosis and dense endocardial fibroelastosis. So once again, a parasternal long axis, and this patient has got a patent but very stenotic aortic valve with a small jet of um, uh, ejection coming from this uh, left ventricle into the aortic valve. So the aortic valve domes, um, it's stenotic aortic stenosis and mitral stenosis. We'll go over those in greater detail, but in this particular early stage, we're just looking at what can be seen in the echocardiographic planes that we look at. Here is again a diminutive left ventricle with a patent aortic valve, but you can see that the great vessels were larger than the ascending aorta. So there was a retrograde perfusion of this vessel for even as there was prograde flow and that this varied in during development. <clears throat> and here is the echocardiographic spectrum of this condition. And you see the small mitral valve, which is patent, and the aortic valve, which is patent. But the ventricle has already uh, changed its size compared to the right ventricle. It's markedly diminutive. <clears throat> now we look at short axis imaging. <clears throat> and in the short axis, I've added the presence of a fetal example, this one at 20 weeks. So here's the parasternal short axis cut. Here is the uh, mannequin example of how the scan is obtained on the precordium. Here is the labels. You can see intense endocardial fibroelastosis. The superior and inferior papillary muscles are loaded in the left ventricle, and there is marked left ventricular hypertrophy. You see the endocardial fibroelastosis here and is also rep um, reproduced here on the echocardiogram. The left ventricle is virtually functionless. The endocardial fibroelastosis is seen all the way around. And I've added in this example, a fetal example at 21 weeks to show that once the endocardial fibroelastosis has fixed the left ventricle, it is incapable of filling and uh, its uh, fate is set and you can see that the size of the scale here is virtually the same. So there's been no growth that has occurred from fetal life in this postnatal example. Now, we can also look at this heart from above, and this is the same heart, which shows a pseudo unicuspid valve with a high parasternal cut here. <clears throat> and you can see the, um, the pseudo unicuspid valve here. The pulmonary valve by comparison is larger and fine with delicate valve leaflets on it. Remember, this is left and this is right, and the echo, this is right and this is left. So here is the aorta, and this patient demonstrates sinusoids, which we'll see when it's road, and this is the retrograde flow coming into the aorta from the sinusoids. And these two frames, the first frame shows that picture, and the second frame shows the sinusoids coming into the left ventricle, or coronary fistula, as we prefer to call them. And they drain into the left circumflex artery in this particular example that we're showing here. And we'll zoom in on that. <clears throat> and I can show you that these are two frames. And here is the sinus, the coronary fistula. And then when we look at the next frame, you can see the, um, the um, sinusoids here and then draining uh, into a septal artery as well as the, um, the circumflex coronary artery and back into the ascending aorta. 
Now, this is an apical four ch chamber cut, and I've used this specifically in a patient with mitral atresia and aortic atresia. Here is the left atrium, and here is the left ventricle. The AV groove separates the left atrium from the left ventricle. The only egress from the left atrium is through the oval foramen into the right atrium, and the right atrium drains into through the tricuspid valve into the left ventricle. And this is perfectly matched with an echocardiogram, which shows the left atrium, the groove, which is present here, no left ventricle, as often is present, with a tricuspid valve present here, uh, and the atriums separated by an atrial septum, which we'll go into greater detail in a while. So this is mitral atresia with aortic atresia and no left ventricle. And in this condition, there are never sinusoids because there's never been any flow going into the left ventricle the, for which the, there is uh, no egress as well. So no ingress and no egress, no sinusoids. Here is the subcostal sagittal cut with an echocardiographic plane showing the subcostal sagittal cut. You can see the fine crisscrossing trabeculations on the apex of the ventricle, together with the papillary muscles in this diminutive left ventricle, which compares with the size of the right ventricle here. Here's the right atrial appendage, the pulmonary trunk, right pulmonary artery, duct, arterial duct, left pulmonary artery, the pulmonary vein, which is often enlarged and hypertrophic if there's obstruction, and the left atrial appendage coming out just above the ventricle. And here is an echocardiogram on the right showing the same features with the small left ventricle and large right ventricle. Okay, and here is the left pulmonary artery, the liver and the diaphragm are below. And you can see that there is almost no function on this left ventricle. And now we'll just zoom this in. I'll change the orientation. So the orientation is identical here. Uh, it's not anatomic, but it conforms with what we see on the echocardiogram, as you see it here with the diaphragm here, the left ventricle here, the papillary muscles with a little mitral valve present within it. Once they're papillary muscles, there's usually a mitral valve. And the diminutive non-functioning size of this left ventricle. <clears throat> now we can look in the sagittal, from the sagittal cut to the coronal cut. And here we're looking at the conventional uh, position, which looks very much like we see on an echocardiogram. And the, here's the cut. Here's the left ventricle and the mitral valve. There's the aortic connection to the ascending aorta. And you can see that the right ventricle is apex forming over here. And here we see the echocardiogram showing the same features with a non-functioning endocardial fibroelastotic left ventricle, a plate-like aortic atresia with the aortic valve over here, and the functioning right heart on the other side, and the pulmonary trunk above the left atrium as we see it here. So this more or less takes care of the planes. I have not added the suprasternal planes, but we will see these as we get to look at the ascending aorta later in this presentation. So let's begin again and looking at mitral atresia, aortic atresia. And these are the specimens we showed in the first example. And here we're comparing this again to what you see here, but in greater detail to show the right ventricle from wall to wall with tricuspid regurgitation already present and a diminutive left atrium uh, and uh, with a, a patent flow uh, and no connection between the left atrium and the ventricular mass as we see it on the specimen. <clears throat> now we move from the no left ventricle to the teeny weeny left ventricle. And here I've highlighted in a dot arrow for your um, viewing, that you can see the small left ventricle, there's the coronary artery. Here's the left atrium. There is a continuity between the left atrium and the left ventricle. But this is a, or a you know, from the size of this is totally useless. Here's the eustachian valve, the inferior vena cava, and the atrial septum separating the right atrium, which is much larger than the left atrium. And the continuity of flow between the um, 
the right atrium and the underlying right ventricle. And the echocardiogram will show the same features <clears throat> with the same labels. And here you see the diminutive left ventricle with a little endocardial fibroelastosis present in it. A perfect subcostal uh, coronal cut showing mitral valve atresia. So the valve is present, but it's atretic and a diminutive left ventricle. <clears throat> now, the next phase on is this is the mitral stenosis with endocardial fibroelastosis. And this specimen will be shown again. The ventricular coronary fistula is present, marked endocardial fibroelastosis, limiting the size of the growth. And the reason why this heart doesn't have the atriums in is because this patient underwent a heart transplant and the atrial mass was largely left intact to take uh, the um, new transplant in it. So here's a small hypoplastic um, aort, um, left ventricle uh, from an explant. And I'll go immediately to the uh, echocardiogram after birth. And the, oh, that's, uh, I did the, sorry, the wrong way. This is the fetal echocardiogram showing the same essential features with a, a, a mitral valve, which is not moving, and a tretic mitral valve. You see the big pulmonary veins in the fetus. And the size of these scales has been matched so uh, that the size of the ventricle, you can see, has not grown. There's some motion of the mitral valve in this example, suggesting mitral stenosis rather than atresia, endocardial fibroelastosis, and hypertrophy of the pulmonary vein veins because of obstruction at atrial level of uh, flow from the left atrium into the right atrium. So the left atrium is diminutive in size, and note the disproportionate size of the pulmonary veins, indicating some obstruction at atrial level. Now we'll move to a bigger left ventricle here with a little endocardial fibroelastosis on the left side. Presumably this anatomy occurred later on in utero, the insult or the development uh, stopped and the left ventricle is somewhat larger. There's the four chambers, left, right, left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle. And here's the echocardiogram showing flow essentially coming into the left atrium, not crossing much into the right atrium. So there's some obstruction. And there is also minimum endocardial fibroelastosis in the same place on the echo as it is on the specimen here. <clears throat> now, a somewhat larger left ventricle, I've used the fetal example here to show the larger left ventricle. Of course, in the passage of time, as the right-sided chambers grow, the left ventricle becomes more diminutive, but sometimes it doesn't. And here you can see a thin layer of endocardial fibroelastosis on the specimen. We'll take that off so that you can see it. You've seen the labels. Here we go. This is the inferior cable vein. And here are the four chambers with the reasonable size left ventricle and still with some function of this diminutive left ventricle in utero. This is, of course, a late, um, not much in the way of growth at the nearly 36 weeks uh, of uh, fetal life here. Yeah. And then there's this example, which is an example of extreme endocardial fibroelastosis with marbling of the endocardium. The endocardial fibroelastosis is heaping up and diminishing further the size of the left ventricular outflow tract here and is encroaching on the mitral valve and papillary muscles so that the papillary muscles are diminutive as you see them here. And I've matched this with a patient that survived a atrial stenting for this condition in utero. And here you can see the atrial stent between the left and the right atrium. And this is patient survived postnatally as this patient did too. 
And you see here the endocardial fibrolastosis. You see the diminutive mitral valve. You see the lack of function on this left ventricle. You can see the coronary sinus and the descending aorta. And here is the stent coming across the atrium. And we'll expand on this a little later in the presentation. But here you can see uh, the fact that the left ventricle has um, been able to grow a little bit. And perhaps in this heart, the endocardial fibroelastosis was not quite as severe as it was in the specimen. This is often relate called marbling because it looks like whitish marble that um, uh, exists off the ventricle and can be surgically removed after birth. Now here is another example where the endocardial fibrosis has obstructed the outlet tract. Uh, we've seen this and you see here I is interim, me is middle and E is outer layers of the left ventricular myocardium. And we explained a little earlier that perfusion from the coronaries occurs from the outside in, but work occurs from the inside out. So the greatest work is inside, the least perfusion is inside, leading to a mismatch, which is why endocardial fibroelastosis develops here. In the media, the work and the perfusion are matched. And on the outlayer, there is actually a little more perfusion than needed to be uh, present in here. And when we look at what happens here, you can see this in the fetus here, that um, there is uh, obstruction at the aortic valve area here. Here's the right ventricle going into the pulmonary artery. Here's the superior cava coming into the left atrium. And again, the apex is definitely formed by the right ventricle. The left ventricle is diminutive. And you can see if we match the scale up here, that the scale shows that the ventricle is fixed in its position by the presence of this intensive fibroelastosis and does not grow and becomes progressively diminutive, as does the ascending aorta with the two coronary arteries uh, and its relationship to the palmary trunk here. And we'll just zoom that in the final position so you can see how small the ascending aorta is as it's only growing to perfuse the coronary arteries and the rest of the heart is growing around this hyperplastic left ventricle and atrium. And here is the endocardial fibroelastosis on a specimen again, again with the diminutive mitral valve. And you can see the EFE all the way around without any function, with a better developed aorta here, with a suggestion of movement of the aortic valve, but with no flow. And here after birth, the same sort of features with a ventricle that has uh, not changed its size much, but um, has um, the presence of mitral perfusion in it and a restrictive atrial septum. We've seen these pictures before. So I'm trying to bring up this point about how the left ventricle uh, is fate is, uh, um, established by different means. Either there's no development of the left ventricle or when the left ventricle and the mitral valve develop, how uh, the, the endocardial fibroelastosis and the ischemia that occurs here, again, you can see the different perfusion layers here. The endothelium, endo, subendocardial layer is fibrotic. Then there's a layer of pale pallor all the way around. And then there's a layer of a uh, reasonable flow and then a layer of excessive flow around this heart. And again, when you look at the echocardiogram after birth, you see how the right ventricle has grown, even though the fact that there's still the patent mitral valve and a patent aortic valve, which is now exhibiting a little aortic insufficiency as well. So now let's move on to the ascending aorta. And we've shown this, how the ascending aorta, when in, in the really atretic ventricle, is nothing more than a conduit of coronary artery flow. And in this circumstance, the coronary artery is small, the ascending aorta is small, uh, one to two to three millimeters at most. 
And this is the conventional form of hyperplastic left heart that we see after birth. The pulmonary trunk goes into the duct and then flows retrograde into the vessels of the head and neck. And once it's given off that, the flow in the coronary artery uh, to the coronary arteries is through this ascending aorta and it fails to develop. And on echocardiogram, you can see this in black and white, which is the left frame here. Here's the ascending aorta. Here's the transverse aorta. Here's the arterial duct and here's the left atrium. And when we superimpose color flow on this, you can see that the flow is retrograde into the aorta here, blue is away, and is prograde around the aortic arch, filling the vessels to the head and neck, and is associated with the jet at this region, because you can see over here, now that you've seen the jet, that there is actually a coarctation, and the coarctation is before the duct, which is very important because that limits the retrograde flow into the aorta and the head and neck, and of course, may be one of the reasons why there is neurodevelopmental outcome abnormalities in hyperplastic left heart. And the bottom echo is the Doppler taken from this descending aortic position, which shows the retrograde flow in the, tra I beg your pardon, in the transverse aorta here uh, in systole, and then prograde flow in diastole related to the retrograde filling of the arterial duct uh, left to right in diastole in this patient. Now the ascending aortic size may be a little increased and here I put this in the parasternal long axis cut and you can see ascending aorta and pulmonary artery together. The right ventricle is uh, solely connected to the pulmonary trunk. Here's a large right atrial appendage and the echocardiogram shows again this ascending aorta. It's important to look for the ascending aorta and not to confuse it either with the pulmonary trunk or with the superior vena cava, which are often present in the same picture. And you can see in this example, the retrograde flow into the aorta together with the presence of coronary ventricular fistulae or sinusoids as they used to be called uh, in this heart with a diminutive left ventricle as well. <clears throat> sinusoids, retrograde flow. Now the aorta may be larger and I've shown a little larger example. Here's endocardial fibrolastosis, mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis. And here you can see an echocardiogram that is matched to this in the subcostal uh, oblique projection. There's the left ventricle with the endocardial fibrolastosis and the fibrotic papillary muscles with low function of this remaining left ventricle, the apex forming right ventricle, the sinusoids here suggesting previous forward flow here and a more, uh, a larger size ascending aorta than we saw in the previous example going round into the arch as we see it over here. And this is the nominate vein in front of the arch as we see it. And notice the right ventricle function is substantially better than the left ventricle. Now, a larger example, and here's an aorta, which is obviously carrying flow across it. We'll see it in the presence here. A little false tendon is noted here. Nice size mitral valve. Uh, papillary muscles look like they're all close together. Maybe a parachute valve with a bicuspid uh, valve, which is uh, obstructed, uh, but was at one stage patent, leading to a larger ascending aorta. And in the echo, the aorta is substantially larger, even though the left ventricle is non functioning, but has both an aortic valve and a mitral valve, which open. Uh, and uh, then when we put the Doppler color flow system on this, you can see alternate red and blue flow. So there's some prograde flow into the ascending aorta, but when you get round to the arch and the transverse aorta, the perfusion to the head and neck is largely through retrograde flow from the arterial duct.
And then, of course, we have to look at the presence of co-optation. And I'll tell you that 70 to 80% of patients with hyperplastic left heart also have a co-optation. The surgeons know this, and they have to take care of this. Otherwise, there's obstruction that develops afterwards. We've seen this picture before, and this is a pre-ductal co-optation, because here's the pulmonary trunk, there's the arterial duct, and here is the obstruction at the pre-ductal level. And this is usually the situation. So that even though there's flow going backwards, it's somewhat obstructed. And we've mentioned the development of this condition. There's the stenosis. We've seen this picture before. But I wanted to just illustrate it with the specimen as you see it here. And here's another one with a different example of a narrowed aorta. And you can see the narrowing is associated with the transverse uh, uh, aorta uh, retrograde flow uh, coming to the vessels, the head and neck. And here is the co-optation underneath the aorta and the whole descending aorta sent over here. And look at the size of this innominate vessel. The innominate vessel is large probably because of anomalous drainage of the pulmonary veins to a vertical vein. We'll show you that in a moment too. And just lastly, another example showing the extreme narrowing that can occur in this region, obviously almost always preductal in its situation. This is a frontal picture with trachea, vessels, three vessels, the head and neck, diminutive ascending aorta, pulmonary trunk going into an arterial duct and the descending aorta, the proximal shelf, just almost duct to ductal with the arch above it over there, as we see on the echocardiogram here. Now, the next area of importance is restriction of the atrial septum. And this is often a nightmare for the, neonate, for the uh, for perinatal cardiologist. And here you can see from Andrew Cook's beautiful in uh, situ dissection and cutting the uh, right heart with tremendous hypertrophy the little left ventricle in the hip pocket, a huge coronary sinus, a small left atrium with almost total closure of the foramen ovale. Here's the two portions of the atrial septum. You can see this diminutive flow and also this tremendous hypertrophy that goes into the pulmonary veins as they try and aid the left atrium to expel blood across uh, into the left ventricle, of course, this mitral valve is diminutive and going nowhere. So I'll take the, cut, the image off so that you can see this beautifully uh, dissected example here and matched with an echocardiogram, which shows an accelerative jet occurring from the left atrium as the blood flow comes from the left atrium to the right atrium in this condition. And this is a postnatal example. And on the right, I have a prenatal example showing the black and white image with the little foramen up here, the pulmonary veins with all of their flow, the diminutive left ventricle, and the right ventricle in front of that. There, and here we see that. And I, I didn't, wasn't able to expand those images, but the other image expands to show that diminutive flow coming across here, which is the same as it was in utero. Now, when it becomes totally obstructed, then the pulmonary uh, uh, system develops uh, lymphangiectasia. And this is an X-ray showing the presence of this lymphangiectasia after birth with a tremendous uh, reticular pattern within the lung fields. And here is an echocardiogram where that uh, is likely to occur. You see that's the only flow coming out of the atrium here. And the Doppler velocity across this is 13.4 millimeters of mercury or nearly two meters per second, which is, relates to the fact that the, even the volume of flow which is coming across here, which is diminutive, has to squeeze through this and make a jet of uh, uh, atrial shunting. And I have more pictures to show you of this. And here is another example of obstructed atrial septum, which has become aneurysmal and prolapsed through the oval fossa. 
This view is from the right atrium. The right atrium is open. And here you can see this thickened fibrotic atrial septum, which is going nowhere. And then the reticular pattern on the uh, lungs uh, indicating the lymphangiectasia with a low powered microscopy to show the presence of the dilated vessels and these dilated lymphatic structures on the surface of the heart. And again, with a, a, an example showing this aneurysmal formation here, the, it looks like there's a foramen here, but there's actually no foramen happening here. And that is uh, a very um, poor prognosis for these patients. Now we've attempted to try and um, stent these atrial septums. And here is an example of the stent that you can see here coming across in this autopsy specimen. Uh, and it's attempted to be placed from the left atrium into the right atrium or from the right atrium into the left atrium. And here is the angiogram with the frontal and the lateral appearance of that structure. You'll see the balloon is inflated with a stent on it uh, in a moment. Okay, and I've taken the labels off this. I won't put them back on, but here's the stent and two pictures, a subcostal coronal cut showing the flow coming through there. And also on the bottom, a parasternal short axis cut showing the uh, bore of the stent as it crosses the atrial septum, a sort of three-dimensional view of the, that structure. Oh, we've seen that before. I'm going to, in the presence, uh, in, in order for time to just uh, go right through this quickly and get onto the deviation of the atrial septum, the leftward shift of septum premium, which sometimes causes the right pulmonary veins to drain into the left atrium. And here you can see the septum premium. The, the probe is placed from the pulmonary vein, comes into the right atrium, and then has to go into the, uh, through the septum premium into the left atrium. So these pulmonary veins are actually draining to the right side. And that's the feature of this leftward shift of the atrial septum. And here is such an example showing the right pulmonary veins as they drain here into the left atrium, uh, into the right atrium. I apologize for that. They drain from the right pulmonary veins into the right atrium. The septum, of course, is aneurysmal. Okay. But here the right pulmonary veins are draining, and the aneurysm is actually obstructing the flow into that pulmonary vein in the dynamic situation. Now, lastly, the ventricular coronary fistulae. And ventricular coronary fistulae are uh, not a prominent feature as they are in hyperplastic right heart, but they definitely occur. And I want to bring that to your attention. Here is an example of an unusual example with these massive coronary fistulas coming from this diminutive left ventricle. The right ventricle is all the way around this. We're just focusing on this here with the two coronary arteries and the anterior interventricular artery as you see it over here. And now I'm going to look at this example, which was supplied to me by David Robeson, my colleague, and very good friend, who has uh, submitted this picture, showing an example in the fetus uh, uh, of a right coronary artery and then the left coronary artery over here. There's a tresia of this tiny little ventricle. And these are the fistulae coming out of the ventricle and going here. Notice how carefully he has lowered the Nyquist limit to bring out these coronary fistulae, which would not be seen with high velocity flow. So you have to lower the velocity if you want to evaluate uh, the presence of fistulae. And here's the same specimen, a different picture, an angiocardiogram, which I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that the left ventricle is filling from these coronary fistulae here. And I'll take the labels off so that you can see that. Watch this area here. 
There we go. And here you can see from that same example that I showed you before, the sinusoids are draining into this vessel here and draining into the left ventricle and draining from the left ventricle. So here you see very beautifully the whole picture of a hypoplastic left heart, but with some coronary fistulae, which were present and detected in utero as well. And now I'll go back to that example that we showed you, and I'll bring to your attention this area of highlighted with red dots, which is an area of coronary fistulae. And in another heart, here you can see another large coronary fistulae draining this diminutive left ventricle. Look at the size of the right ventricle here. And here I've oriented the heart with right and left atrium, right and left ventricles, and you'll see the flow from this going into the right coronary artery. Here's the spine, here's the sternum, okay? So this is right and this is left. And this picture is also courtesy of Dr. Robeson and shows the filling of the right coronary artery from this left ventricle over here. So the escape is through a coronary fistula. It's not a particularly valuable uh, sign in terms of prognosis. The prognosis is poor when you see this uh, kind of binding. And lastly, we'll look at the collateral pulmonary veins. And this used to be called a levi atrial cardinal vein. We don't call it that anymore. We call it a collateral pulmonary to systemic venous connection because what we've discovered is that you can see this vein and a left superior vena cava to coronary sinus. And that is probably got the, uh, the uh, low lock on the uh, levo atrial cardinal vein. So this is a separate venous structure and there are many venous structures that develop. But this is an example from a 13 year old girl with hyperplastic left heart syndrome that we studied. And here is her ascending aorta. She died of pulmonary vascular disease. The levo atrial cardinal vein kept the arterial duct open. And so she was able uh, to perfuse uh, the body circulation and would have been uh, a candidate for a heart transplant, but uh, this was not done. And uh, she uh, finally succumbed in our laboratory. Uh, and uh, you can see here a little cartoon showing this looking like a vertical vein in total anomalous pulmonary venous return. And indeed, this is what it looks like. And you can see the flow going round backwards, uh, blue flow away, and then red flow in the superior vena cava as it comes into the heart. Now I'm going to zoom in on that and show you another picture here of this levi atrial cardinal vein. There's the duct going into the ascending aorta. This is the left ventricle here, and this is the hypertrophied right ventricle. Here's the tiny ascending aorta with the big pulmonary artery behind it. And here you'll see below, you'll see the tiny little ascending aorta in cross section. You have to look out for this very carefully because it's very small. It's not more than three millimeters in diameter here. And you see these pulmonary arteries. And then you'll see the veins coming into the left atrium and then egressing through this vertical vein and traveling up uh, into the um, innominate vessel, which we've managed not to see in the long axis in this patient. Okay, so here's the superior vena cava. Here's this other vessel that is a anomalous collateral vessel. And you see the big pulmonary artery, of course, this runs up over the top of this vessel on a higher plane that you can't see in single plane. Now, that takes care of hyperplastic left heart syndrome. But there are also small left ventricles that are not included in hyperplastic left heart syndrome because there is a ventricular septal defect. And these are small ventricles, undoubtedly, but are not part of the hyperplastic left heart syndrome. And there are many of them. This is the one that I've just discussed with aortic atresia and ventricular septal defects, unbalanced right dominant AV canals, 
double outlet right ventricle with mitral atresia, and extreme straddling of the left AV valve. Now, I'm not going to talk about these in this presentation. We've talked about a number of these in other presentations that we've given. So I'm going to look just at the mitral atresia with the ventricular septal defect. And this beautiful example taken in an apical four-chamber view is the glass body of uh, Professor Andrew Cook from London, who made many of these specimens, injected this glass into the uh, ventricle and then digested everything off, off this to give you this example. And what you can see here is the left atrium here with the left atrial appendage, an absence of the connection that occurs between the left ventricle and the left atrium, a large interventricular communication, and some flow out the ascending aorta, which when it got over here in the region of the aortic isthmus, became extremely hyperplastic. And as it entered the descending aorta at the junction with the arterial duct, developed a co-optation. So here you see this, and what we can show you is this area and this patient, a co-optation was also present in this patient when I did the examination on this patient. And here is the left atrium, the underlying left ventricle, the interventricular communication. This is not a ventricular septal defect. It's an interventricular communication in this patient. The AV a canal probably shifted all the way over into the right side, and there's mitral atresia and absent connection. So there you go. Absent connection as an example. And here's another one looking at the outlet of this patient. And this patient actually had a beautiful sized left ventricle. You can see the interventricular communication on the right side, the giant pulmonary artery with the origin of the right pulmonary artery, the arterial duct, the retrograde flow into the aorta, and the diminutive ascending aorta. And here in the echocardiogram in this patient is this tiny little ascending aorta, which almost has no flow in it because the velocity is so low that we can't see the blue flow coming into it. But you can see here the interventricular communication, which here I've called a ventricular septal defect inappropriately. Okay, and normal sized ventricles. And this patient can be repaired by connecting the ventricular septal defect to the aorta and then placing a, a homograph conduit between the right ventricle and the amputated uh, branch pulmonary arteries, the so called Norelli or Yasui procedure. And this patient did actually undergo this procedure and did very, very well. So although this is not a, uh, a hyperplastic left heart in the true sense of the word, it is one that can undergo a variation of the uh, procedures and skill that we have at creating this and lead to a, a reasonable outcome because there are two normally developed ventricles in this situation. And here's just an example of a complete AV septal defect, which is also an explant because the, that's remained behind. And here is the AV canal, which is dominant into the left ventricle with this little sliver of a left ventricular chamber seen and also seen on, uh, on uh, this condition. So lastly, we could look at the evaluations post-operatively. Here's a full echocardiographic evaluation is absolutely essential, but we have to focus on where the operation was done, the atrial com communication, the adequacy on source of pulmonary blood flow, how's the shunt working, what's the adequacy of the arterial communication, ventricular function, tricuspid regurgitation, the presence of effusions, and the presence not shown on this of the arterial communication uh, co-optations as well. So here we are looking at a post Norwood in the operating room, and you can see the widely patent atrial septum, the still diminutive uh, left ventricle with minimal AV valve regurgitation, the right ventricle with some mild tricuspid regurgitation. And we look at the atrial septum a little later, 
and you can see that this here is the two remnants of the atrial septum with a large a patent communication. We have noticed that this may diminish over passage of time, so you have to keep on looking for this. And this one is a beauty. I'm going to show the position of the subcostal sagittal cut here, remove that, and show you the homograph in white on both sides, and the native aorta here in brown, which is uh, what you'd expect to see. And the sutures go from the one side of the aorta all the way around onto the pulmonary valve and round onto the ascending aorta here as the homograph, and then uh, connect in so that this becomes the neo aorta, the neo aorta. And I'll take the, the picture off so that you can see that beautiful dissection with an astomosis here. Here is the final communication to the old primitive left ventric, left, uh, left aorta through this little communication. So this has to be of adequate size because this is the coronary perfusion. And we can see this on the echocardiogram here. Here's the old aorta and here's the new aorta over here or the neo aorta. And here is this little communication and you see it without any flow disturbance over here. So it must be adequate in size there. And we'll just zoom in on that so that you can get another look at this. And here you can, you can see this two millimeter difference here of the aorta and how this patch balloons out and allows this neo aorta to become large and attached to the distal aorta over here. Now, of course, not everything is hunky-dory in these patients. Yeah, we've seen tricuspid regurgion, it may get worse. When the patient came off pump, the right ventricle showed ex exhibited huge amounts of tricuspid regurgitation. So the surgeon went back and did an annular plasty. And now you see there's not, <coughs> a substantial degree of mitral insufficiency, but at the expense, there is a small degree of stenosis that is uh, occurred across the valve. And uh, we considered that this was adequate and left this patient with this to carry on, grow and develop. And of course, shunts are so important. And here's a shunt uh, carried on here into the uh, left ventricle. Uh, into the pulmonary arteries, I beg your pardon. And here's the BT shunt as you see it here. I'll take the pictures off and the label and you can see the green uh, little dots on the shunt between the right pulmonary artery and the base of the anominate. And here's an angiogram showing the same, but this patient had beautiful uh, pulmonary artery anatomy. And this patient of ours had a example of narrowing of the shunt towards the right pulmonary artery. And of course this occurred after the uh, procedure as the shunt uh, started to distort the pulmonary arteries and will be corrected at the time of the Glenn procedure which would be done shortly after this when the patient is three to four months of age. So remember to look at the branch pulmonary arteries when you evaluate a BT shunt, or if you do a SANO, here's the SANO procedure. Okay, so we've got the old aorta, the new aorta, and the conduit to the pulmonary arteries. And here is an echocardiogram from the subcostal coronal plate showing the old aorta, the anastomosis, the, inter, the communication, and the new aorta. Uh, which is the old pulmonary artery, and then the Sano shunt. And this was a lucky uh, example of getting this in one echocardiographic plane. Old aorta, little pulmonary in, uh, uh, neo aortic insufficiency, and here is the Sano shunt. Now we can take this here, you see the anastomotic line between the pulmonary artery and the aorta with the homograph patch making the neo aorta over here. And here we're looking just at the uh, conduit. We use a little uh, conduit 
uh, in an, a contegra uh, conduit in the, 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 the Norwood here. And uh, we think this works a little better than the standard SANO that you see here. And um, you can see that there's some flow disturbance across this uh, flow as you see it here, uh, uh, limiting the degree of pulmonary blood flow, which is, indeed is also unfortunate, a fortunate phenomenon. So there's the pulmonary trunk with a little pulmonary insufficiency. And here's the origin of the SANO through the outlet muscle uh, into the conduit and the bifurcation. And not to forget, the most important thing is to evaluate for coarctation. And here is the patient who died because the coarctation was not recognized. Then that doesn't have to be severe because the right ventricle cannot handle excess afterload. So here is an example of a coarctation that occurred at the distal site where the coarctation usually occurs and is the hardest for the surgeon to patch. So you have to look at this as an ultrasonographer to define this. And of course, it's relatively easy. And here's an example of a, um, an, a, a, an echo with narrowing and the tissue example of um, a power Doppler showing this narrowing and the abdominal aorta showing this very abnormal signal related to a flow disturbance. And this can occur with mild obstruction as well as was present uh, in this patient. And of course, the presence of infection can occur and here's infection. And we see that there, there's the infection down there. And here is a thrombus, as you see it over here, that can occur in this deadly ventricle. So I think I've gone over my time. I'm not going to describe for you in the uh, detail there because of the time constraints, uh, the operation uh, of the hybrid procedure, which we've got several examples, but you can look at that on the um, uh, MD1 World uh, findings if you're interested in seeing that. So I'm going to stop now and take questions from you, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much for your attention. Amazing, Norman. Thank you very much. I learned a lot, and I think our uh, attendees learned a lot uh, as well. We have Dr. Rima Bader from Saudi Arabia with us today as a panelist. Uh, welcome uh, on this uh, session, Rima. So if you want to make uh, some comments about the presentation before we have the questions. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, I've enjoyed listening to our master, uh, Dr. Silverman, and also uh, we always get him in the fetal series with Under Congenital Heart Academy. We've learned a lot. Dr. Silverman, I enjoyed, uh, I came a bit late, I'm sorry, but I just wanted to understand from you really the theory behind the uh, coronary sinusoids in a hypoplast, because I understand there's a spectrum. And so how can we as echocardiographers think that if we forget to lower the, the NICOS limit, um, how, where do we, when do we expect to see coronary sinusoids in a hypoplast? Uh, thank you. Well, thank you for that question, Rima, and welcome. The, um, the answer is that um, I think if you look at uh, obstructed ventricles, whether they right or left, these sinusoids, which are primitive, uh, and we should call them ventricular coronary fistula, uh, with their present, they, uh, they, they're present in all patients and they are trees over a period of time as the ventricle develops. Uh, and uh, so they present both in hyperplastic right and hyperplastic left. I'll be discussing the right ones um, next month. But they present and they are at sometimes of no significance. But when there is a lot of obstruction, they may act as a source of escape of ventricular blood. And particularly if the atrioventricular valve, the mitral or the tricuspid valve are competent, then any blood coming into the left ventricle has to uh, attempt to egress from that ventricle with systole. And the place that that does it largely is either through AV valve regurgitation 
or through coronary sinusoids. So they, they seem to be present in, in, in all patients. If you lower the Nyquist limit on the echo, you'll often see little areas that uh, you've got to be careful not to go too low because when you get too low, you get a lot of noise. But you can see sinusoids in a number of these ventricles. We just sort of look at the big ones. And of course, um, in both conditions, when you see sinusoids, the prognosis is really substantially worse. So uh, I think that they are um, embryological uh, remnants, uh, that they are present, and that at both in the right and the left heart, they are generally not important, but when they become big, they do certainly become uh, a problem in terms of management. So to summarize, this is like a, a ventilation or egress. So like if we have uh, the uh, right ventricle or pulmonary atresia intact septum, and then we look for it because it's, uh, it's a way to go out. You're trying to, we have to look at it also in the left ventricle. If I have mitral atresia, aortic atresia, a spectrum, a no VSD, then I should really look for, I mean, I will not have to look. They will be there and they will be big, right? But uh, no, if I have a VSD is... with a hypoplast, no. Sorry? Dr. Yeah. Anderson has made the point, and I think very importantly, that when you don't get egress into the ventricle through the atrioventricular valve, you don't get these sinusoids. Now, of course, that's very rare that we can see that in hyperplastic right heart syndrome. Uh, but in hyperplastic left heart syndrome, if there's no mitral valve, then there are no sinusoids because there's no blood flow getting into the ventricle. Uh, in that situation. So I think the presence of sinusoids uh, defines the presence of a, at some time, patent mitral valve. Oh, great. So the extremes, they're not there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Silver. Uh, we yes. have uh, two questions. Uh... Norman, that uh, the first one is that uh, a comment uh, from uh, Tavalai uh, saying that uh, on the echo films that you're showing, it seems that in the ascending aorta endothelium, you could find some uh, um, fibrillostosis. So he's asking if it, this is true or not, or if it was something that he was just seeing. I'm sorry, um, are you looking at, in cases of mitral atresia, aortic atresia, what kind of fluid is bent in the left ventricle? Is that the question? No, I was uh, reading one question that is in the chat, but ah, uh, you, can, uh, you can answer <laughs> either of, either of them. The chat. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about this. I don't think you see uh, EFE in the, in, the, in the ascending aorta because the pressure in the ascending aorta is, uh, is, is very low. Uh, I, I don't think you see uh, heaped up endothelium. I mean, we've noticed heaped up endothelium in other conditions like in Williams syndrome. You can definitely see that the ascending aorta and the intima are thickened when you look at them with high uh, uh, frequency. So um, I think that that sort of uh, answers, the, answers the question on the track, on the, yes, sure. on the chat. Yeah, we um, have on the q &A one question. In cases of mitral atresia, aortic atresia, what kind of fluids is in the left ventricle? Well, uh, the remnants of uh, blood fluid, because, you know, there's fluid in the ventricle as it develops. Uh, so... Um, it's a, it's very. I've never noticed any really real blood in the ventricle. They look like they they fairly empty, uh, but uh, they can have, of course, um, a, a transudate fluid going into the ventricle. But it's only minimum. Okay. And the the, sec the second question about what gradient constitutes a restrictive atrial septum? Well, uh, the the question is actually should be better defined is what transatrial gradient is dangerous. And um, because I think that a number of patients will have a mild uh, velocity of flow across the atrial septum, but I, we used largely the views of what happens uh, 
at the reversal of the atrial wave uh, in, in the pulmonary veins as a dynamic of, uh, of being concerned. So I would suggest that um, if you look at the Doppler in the pulmonary veins and you see a big A wave reversal of flow within the pulmonary veins, that that indicates there's a hemodynamic obstruction of significance. Minor degrees, there's, you know, the danger of doing something on a patient with a minimum gradient is such a risk to the patient, both for life and for morbidity, that one should only attempt um, restriction or uh, an obstruction of the atrial septum under the direst of circumstances. And the results for doing this uh, universally have been poor. Perfect. As a cardiac intensivist, I would say that a little bit of restriction is good to keep the patient stable before uh, the surgery. But of course, we, we, we have lung congestion and things like that. We need to act. But little, when the patient has a very big ASD, it's a sign of trouble. This patient needs to be sent to the OR uh, sooner than, than the other patients. But I also would like to add that uh, with the with the Norwood, uh, sorry, with the Norwood, they do septectomy anyhow, right? So it's part of it. Yes. Uh, no, no, then when you do the, but then when you do the, the correction, when you do the procedure, during yeah. the, the Norwood, yeah. they yeah. remove the septum, yes. Yeah, it's a, yes. It's a, I mean, it's a, before like about it's a three after. minute procedure to take the atrial septum out. It's very quick. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. It was an amazing, amazing session. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of views on YouTube on this one because uh, it's really good and people are going to comment and share with their colleagues. I've learned a lot. For sure, I'm going to share with my team here uh, in Sidra. Norma, it was amazing. Rima, I need to tell you that I've been to Saudi Arabia. I told you that. Amazing country. Congratulations. Beautiful country. Uh, the hosts were amazing. The Arabic uh, culture is something that uh, really... Uh, get us there in a very uh, kind way and we feel we felt so so great there very nice country where i saw your photos in in the in twitter i mean thank you for uh, those nice comments and i'm i'm sure we'll have you one day here in jeddah where we have the beaches in and it's beautiful you can go snorkeling and do whatever you like uh, but uh, yes, I, I, cardiac intensive care team are very active in Saudi. Uh, I'm sure they've learned quite a lot from you, Grace. It, it was amazing. It was a nice uh, meeting. I was very happy to be there. Well, Norman, thank, thank you, you very much. Hope to see you soon. Yes, uh, we'll be back uh, on Friday, I think. Yes, Friday we have two activities, guys. And we have uh, Dr. Merrill's Anderson and Dr. Mary Cohen. Yes, I'm going to attend that session too. Perfect. So send me an a, a invite and I'll become a panelist there too. Perfect. Thank you very much, Grace and Sasha, and uh, to the Congenital Cart Academy. And remember that uh, you can always look at these sessions again uh, at the Congenital Heart Academy. I do that myself, not of my own talks, obviously, but I find it it's such a great value to listen to other people's talks and get some of the uh, nuances that maybe get uh, swept over in my mind, uh, put in a straight place by looking at it again and have your colleagues look at them as well. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.